Hello. Hello. Nice to have you on the show. Congratulations on this new record. Thank you. Thanks. When is this the best album you've ever made? Uh, not a big list kind of dude, but it's. <laughs> I think it's pretty good. Yeah. You've got four, so it's not hard to list them. You yeah. Can... I would... Um, it's the longest album we've ever made. <laughs> like, well, I want to stick to the facts and not talk about <laughs> things. We can talk about things that are objectively nothing true. subjective, yeah. <laughs> right, right. So you can empirically say that it is the longest record. Yeah, but we're here today to actually talk about our acting career. <laughs> we could just stay on topic. <laughs> you love that joke so <laughs> much. Stick into it, yeah. Um, uh, would you say that to Tom Petty? Every, every record that you've made does sound distinct from uh, the last one. I mean, Reflector is, is no exception. Jeremy, did, did you have a, a set goal in mind in terms of what you wanted with this record? Or, or did that just develop organically? No, I mean, we we had been playing... We always have like a big chalkboard of songs uh, that is super, super... Uh, there's a pretty wide-ranging styles of music and all that kind of stuff. And then at a certain point, it just becomes clear that we're narrowing it down without even really consciously doing it, but we just kind of gravitate towards a certain set of songs, which kind of happened this one, like the songs that we decided, or even just happened to be working on, sort of were, inform- were part of this more rhythmic, whatever you want to call it, like world. And it just sort of naturally gravitated towards a batch of them. Do you actually have a chalkboard or is that a metaphorical chalkboard? No, we did have a chalk. Regine's really good at the chalkboard. You have yeah, a big yeah. chalkboard and yeah, you write the chalkboard. songs on it? Yeah. And then erase stuff that you don't want yeah. on the record? Actually, when we, la- when, we, um, when we put out it, we put out a photo of the chalkboard with the track listing and a couple really sharp fans noticed so you could see all the suburbs song titles <laughs> on it underneath. It's like, oh, Well, you're eye. reusing. <laughs> it's, it's environmentally correct. Nice job, nerds. Actually, we cleaned out a, a space that we're not using anymore, and I have one of the chalkboards in my... We're analog at chalk. Home, and it's still got, technology. like, the Neon Bible songs on it. I'm like, oh, yeah, that song. We never... Right, right. You, you opt not to use a computer. It's all... Yeah, you all, we like, didn't use any computers You count the all. songs on an abacus as well. Us and Daft Punk, no computers. <laughs> right. Right. Where, so where do these chalkboards... Only for pornography. Where... <laughs> Where does the chalkboard live? The Just main, cha- the main. There chalkboard. are m- there are many. There's a few chalkboards. Yeah. Right. So you don't reuse them all. Are we still talking about chalkboards? <laughs> <laughs> but let's talk about the important things. We're only talking about how we write the titles of the songs down. So only. I was enjoying it. I was. In, uh, it's an interesting process. Regina has excellent part of the process. Yeah, really? but it's funny because we we're sort of vol- we have a volatile relationship with the chalkboard or the whiteboard, as it were. Because if you put up a calend- a whiteboard calendar too right. early in the process, we get squirrely and really <laughs> a kind of nerve like tense. So. We actually we went straight from the Grammys. We actually went straight to Haiti. Literally, we f- we flew to. From LA, from LA to Haiti, right. and that was our first time playing in Haiti as a band. So, it was this really, in a way, that kind of like incredible culture shock of like winning the Grammy, being in like a weird after party, getting on a plane, getting on important prints, and and playing in rural Haiti. Like maybe three days later, um, just feeling what it did to the music and how we played differently, and so. Even though we were a long ways from making a record at that point, it's, I still feel like the seeds of kind of because we were like, oh, when we right. come back here, I want to have more songs that we can actually. Let, 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 I want to yeah. get to the, all of that. That's first of all. I mean, two steps back. You win the Grammy. By that point, this record, the suburbs, had just been fetid around the world. It was so epic. It was so successful. Did you at that point? I mean, was there sort of any conversation, if not with each other, with, inside your heads, of, of how do we? How do we even approach making another record after we've made what people are calling a masterpiece? When? I mean, not really. I mean, we we still feel like the total weirdos at any of this, any of these things. You know, like we, it's not like when we when we won the Grammy, that was probably the most strange audience we've ever played to. <laughs> people were just looking at us like we were from outer space. You know, like. Mm. I felt a little bit better about it recently because I remember watching Nirvana on the VMAs when I was a kid and thinking, you know, like how they own the world and then watching it again, it was like, it was Nirvana, CNC Music Factory, Aerosmith, Guns N' Roses. Like they were, it wasn't like the Nirvana show. They were like the total weirdos and they weren't even able to play the song that they wanted to play. And it was like, 
it wasn't like they ruled the world. They were still like, okay, you freaks can play your song, but then get the hell out of here when you're done, you know? So even kind of growing up in the middle of the kind of alternative culture boom, right. it was still like Jane's addiction was not the norm, you know? Like they were still pretty freaky. Yeah, just because they <laughs> become something really important, yeah. like in, in the context of where they were. Yeah. It's like, mm. <laughs> Pretty odd. I do remember that Grammy night. People were scratching their heads when, after you won, you played. Yeah. Uh, to close it. And, yeah, Eminem uh, did not look too impressed. <laughs> and we got lo- and we were locked out of our backstage room, so it was like straight backed and re- Did we really and, win? And security yeah. guards were in that regime backstage after. Just like, oh, you have to wait in the hallway for literally 10 minutes. I answered every single text I got. And they're just like, why are you texting me? I'm like, well, I'm just standing here. Like, <laughs> I've just won the Grammy. No one knows who we are. There is Nicole Kidman. It is confusing. There are a lot of us. But there's well, well, the the other thing though is, I mean, you know, it's interesting when you talk about Haiti. You talk about the the dance crews on this record. When the last time, one of the last times we did a big interview was, it was right before the suburbs, and it was in your rehearsal space or something in Montreal, and it was really hot. It was really sweaty, and and I think of that because this record, this new reflector. It feels like a sweaty record. It feels like you're in a in a gritty kind of club. It feels like people are 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 moving and and sweating. Does that does that does that resonate? And 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 did these songs then come out of jamming as a band, or or did you come to the recording process with finished songs and and lay them down? It's kind of the, it was kind of a similar process to how we always work. But um, I mean, a song like "Here Comes the Nighttime" or you know, a couple of the songs are pretty different from anything we've done before. And, and so it definitely, we kind of had an idea in our head of what we wanted to do, but to actually physically figure out how to do it, it, you know, took us a while just to, um, you know, cause we kind of had a sound in our head that I think we were kind of going for. And, um, but it wasn't quite in the muscle memory or anything. Yeah, I mean, it's it's. What does it's, it mean to have to physically do it, right? Well, it's it's interesting because you know it's usually it's like you kind of get your influences between fifteen and twenty, and then you're kind of stuck with those. And the whole experience of of being in Haiti and Jamaica, at least for me, was kind of like being turned on to five hundred great bands like late in life, rather than just like oh, I heard this band. It's like I heard huh. I heard like three hundred years of music, and so. Um, you know, like a song like Here Comes the Nighttime, which sounds like The Cure on a certain level, but then also has elements of of dub and Haitian rah-rah. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, I think that if we, it sounds like a normal song to people, then it's a huge accomplishment, you know, because it's like, it was definitely for us making it, it was like, okay, how do we get, we know what we want to do, but how do we yeah. do this, you know? You, it's, I mean, you're marrying dance crews with, um, when you've called it Haitian voodoo. Um, and uh, I don't know if you want to elaborate on what Haitian voodoo means. I mean, voodoo, voodoo rhythm, there's just a lot of, in, in, in voodoo, a lot of the kind of ceremonies are based around rhythms and around, I mean, a lot of them are African, African rhythms. Um, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of really old rhythms that, you know, you probably don't even hear in Nigeria anymore that might've come from Nigeria that are in rural Haiti. So there, there's these kind of strands of, of music, um, but a lot of that is incorporated into just even normal compa and, and kind of Haitian music in general. And you uh, said when you were attending uh, the carnival in Port-au-Prince, you said, wearing a mask and dancing, I felt less of a break between the spirit and the body. It makes you feel like a hack being in a rock band. Well, I mean, the Haitian carnival, all they have is a bit of paint and some paper mache and some cardboard, and it's like 50 times bigger spectacle than any Cirque du Soleil show I've ever been to. I mean, it's mm-hmm. incredible. Um, and it's so, I mean, I, the idea of going to Ibiza and like being surrounded by a bunch of rich kids on ecstasy and trying to dance is mm-hmm. about number one trillion on the list of things <laughs> I'd want to do in my life. But being like on a beach in Haiti and someone gets out a drum and then kids come out of like the forest and like come dance till three in the morning and you jump in the ocean. Like I was like, okay, I, I can relate to that. But you did know? it, did it actually change the way you approach what being in a rock band means? No, it's more of a challenge. It's like, if you see someone that's way better than you at something and you're like, why am I getting paid to do this when mm. these people do this for free, just for love anonymously. And it's, and it's more accomplished or more visually stunning or more creative or scarier or, you know, 
it just kind of if we're going to charge people to come see us like okay maybe we need to do something that has approaches the amount of spirit at least, at least yeah. have it be real you know so when you're integrating um say haitian or or um sounds you might have felt in the musical influence of jamaica when you're recording there how do you ensure you're you're not simply appropriating it uh, that you're respecting the art form itself or do you worry about that in the process of, of well, incorporating i mean regine is haitian and i have a half haitian son and i feel though i'm super not haitian i I've, I've you know spent the better part of seven years, really deeply engrossed in the culture and, and uh, we have family that is from that background. And um, so, I mean, for Regine, Regine always wanted to be able to play music like we're playing now, right. even from the beginning. And, and our first kind of hit, if you could call it a hit, like back in the day was a song called Headlights Look Like Diamonds, which when we would play it, like that was the first time, it was very New order kind of dance song. And that was the first thing I remember playing and people would just lose their minds and dance. And and that was kind of right around the same time as um, I remember um, House of Jealous Lovers came out, really like just after we'd done Headlights and not feeling like that was a million also, miles away. I also feel know? like this album seems influenced by or in the spirit of um, some 80s bands that, that also featured global musical elements in their music. I'm thinking of The Clash and I'm thinking of Talking Heads in particular. Did you take note of how they approached using non-Western music when making this record? Um, Not really, to be honest, but I... I you understand why people hear those sounds in your music? Or? No, of course. I mean, The Clash, I mean, Talking Heads, what bigger... Like the police heroes, whatever, you know. yeah. I mean, um, I I think I think it's important for something not to be a caricature. I mean, I uh, it's not like we're trying to make Haitian music. It's it it it's more just being open to an influence. Um, I think the difference is allowing yourself to be changed by that music. I mean, one of the things that was interesting about the Clash was it wasn't like it's their own weird version of reggae. You know, it's not like that. Them just like, they're not aping it. They're not aping it. They're just super inspired by it, even in the fashion and, and, and felt like, um, on the same team, you know, it's like if you're in London at that time and the only other weirdos were like the Rastas and you'd go hang out in the club and like, Hey, we're weirdos too. And let's all be weirdos together. Well, ska and reggae were offshoots of the new wave and and punk movement. So Mm -hmm, it was all kind of a, Seen together. Mishmash, yeah. I'm curious, like, I mean, you also rec- record a lot of the record in Jamaica. Uh, does d- d- Did simply being in a place have an impact on the feel of this album, Jeremy? Yeah, I mean, Jamaica is so, there's music everywhere. It's just blasting. And we were a little bit tucked away. Like, we were all in a house together and playing in the bedroom. But, you know, the minute we turned the amps off, you could hear music coming from, like, the east and the west like (laughs) down the beach or whatever um and certainly just being surrounded by by that probably had an influence but i really remember we were working on reflector in jamaica and marcus draz was trying to get us to play it faster and faster (laughs) because we were still learning how to play the song and we couldn't physically play it as fast as it wanted to be played and (laughs) and it was like maybe midnight we've been playing it for maybe like four hours or something and we were starting to like, we got the groove like kind of at the tempo we wanted it to be. And just kind of out of nowhere, these two Jamaican security guards just like waltz in the room and just start throwing down, like dancing, yeah. like, they're, like, <laughs> like at a nightclub. Like, now just, we're like, talking. Just like full, <laughs> just like just waltz in the room, just like just started throwing down. And we're like, okay, I think we found the right tempo. Yeah. And never saw them again the whole rest of the time we were there. They're just like the night security guards. And <laughs> right. it was like, I guess like, that's the right. That's, there we go. <laughs> but stuff like that was really cool, and all the staff, like in the that we were hanging out with in the house, and they would show us around. And and uh, I mean, Regina and I spent a lot of. We were there maybe six or seven times and hung out with um, Grace Jones, uh, who's from there, and um, it was really cool talking with her because she's kind of is the embodiment of like Studio Fifty Four and African music, and because right. she's like physically. <laughs> It, there's this amazing thing I remember seeing her being by the pool with her granddaughter, who's like the whitest, red haired, freckled, <laughs> like the whitest white person you've ever seen in your life. And her grandma's like the blackest black person that ever lived. And it's like in Jamaica. And I don't know, 
is really, really incredible, you know? I really love this. I mean, you're talking about uh, Jamaica and Haiti. You're talking about this sense of, you feel, I can viscerally almost feel the sense of connection you're talking about. On this, on this, you know, first single, the, the title track, Reflector, when you sing, I thought I'd found a connector, it's just a reflector. And I, I was trying to reflect on that over the, the last few weeks and trying to figure out what you, I mean, it could be a commentary on a lot of things, social media, art itself, this notion that we're just projecting ourselves out into the world and not making real connections. Is that a, a worry for you personally, or are you making a bigger point about the way people interact with each other today? Um, I mean, one of the, without sounding too pretentious, I, I kind of, because I studied philosophy in college, but um, I actually picked up an old book. It was like an essay um, by Kierkegaard called uh, The Present Age, which is kind of his, he's kind of complaining about the times he was living in and about the media and, and, um, but there's, there's this, he kind of talks about the reflective age. Um, he kind of, he talks about there, something called a passionate age or a reflective age. And he kind of makes the point that in a, in a passionate age, if, if there's thin ice and there's a diamond down on the ice, that people, if someone tried to go get the diamond, everyone would gather around and say, yeah, go get the diamond. You can do it. Like they'd say, look at this crazy guy going to get the diamond. That's awesome. And then in a reflective age, people would gather around and say, you idiot, like, what are you doing? The ice is thin, you're going to so, die. Mm. And everyone would be, all the feedback would be, why would you risk yourself to gain something? Um, and he's talking about reflectivity as, as a, like, kind of like being in your head, like reflexive, uh, uh, reflecting, like overthinking everything. Mm. Or, um, And I thought it was really interesting because a lot of what he was describing, I really saw, but 50 times more extreme than what, and then in the early 1800s in Europe, you know, it's like, dude, you have no idea. <laughs> you have, but pre, it, pre Twitter, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. but but it's so on the it's so incredible how on the nose a lot of it was. But anyway, that you know, so there's there's kind of philosophical stuff and and relationship stuff, and you know, a lot of friends. You know, a lot of my friends are they're not 18 years old. It's like you go through really heavy relationship stuff and what it means to be a man and a woman. And, and, uh, you know, so just trying to, but just trying to think about life and relationships and all that kind of it's stuff. It's interesting because that, that what you just described, I mean, maybe it makes sense that you study philosophy and it, it, it's, you, you're, you seem fascinated by conceptual ideas and, and conceptual lyrics. I mean, since your first album, Funeral, your lyrics, you know, in some ways, they almost become less personal. They're 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 about ideas. They're about concepts. And and this is another of the touchstones that reminds is reminds one of Talking Heads or or the Clash or Bowie. Uh, they're not she loves you. You know, in terms of the songs, do you, do you find more personalized songs about love and breakups just boring? Is I don't that... know. I mean, there's some pretty heavy stuff on this record. I think it's a combination. I mean, I. I do think lyrically there's a lot of stuff to talk about that people haven't talked about yet. And I just, it's just like racing to try and get in there first, you know? Also too, like what you write because it is, you know, a craft that you work on, like what you, what some people might think is obtuse when might think of as pretty blunt. So it's, it might, you know, that might be his version of something that's really clear and well, what's an example of that? What do you mean when you say that? Jeremy? Well, I don't know one specifically, but like just trying to like, I'm not a songwriter. I don't write lyrics, but I can imagine the further you, you know, the more you work on it, what I like, if I was to work on something, what I would consider, well, even like playing drums or whatever, like some people might think of something as really complicated or beating around the bush a little bit, but after working on it for 20 years or whatever, I might think of it as something very, like uh clear mm. or something i'm just Let me, we're, we're imagining doing, what doing, it might be like to write lyrics. we're we're, we're uh, we got a call we're on doing a little mini tour and we're supposed to play the neil young um neil young bridge school like uh the killers nice. had to drop out and they were like kind of desperate for an extra person we happen to have a day off so we're like yeah of course because it's one of the more beautiful things you can do and I sure, remember yeah. last time it, the first time I ever saw Neil Young live he was singing Helpless with us on stage it was like okay this is the coolest thing ever but <laughs> he has that thing where he sings these songs he wrote when he was 22 and it's like he wrote them to sing when he was 70 yeah, you know like, like Leonard like, Cohen is the same yeah. same thing yeah, yeah. but there's that really interesting thing that happens with lyrics over time um, 
I'm really I'm kind of hoping that I have this song that I wrote. Uh, it's the only song I ever had a dream about, and I woke up and ran to the piano and wrote down all the lyrics and all the melody, and it's just a Neil Young song. It's like a hundred percent. Like I woke up with a fully written Neil Young song uh, done. So I'm hoping that we can do that with him the next week. Um, uh, if 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 um. If I can give you a, like, let me try this conceptual idea on you guys. Because, I mean, to a certain extent, it seems as though you've reached a point in your career where you could, where you have a lot of creative freedom. You can get a, virtually a, a, anything you ask for. Bowie stops by for tea and ends up singing on your song. I mean, uh, and the orthodoxy would be to sort of say, well, you know, the world is their oyster. And yet, I've had some conversations with artists, musicians, I'm thinking of Jack White, for example, who talk about the value of limits when it comes to shaping uh, the art. Is that something that resonates with you? Is it more complicated to make music now without the kind of limitations, resources-wise, money-wise, creatively, or whatever, that you might have been used to when you first started? I think for us, it's less of a pitfall because I, I feel like we're kind of doing the exact same thing that we've always been doing. Maybe, you know, we spend a little more time doing interviews or, you know, non-musical things, but also we don't have day jobs and it's kind of a balance, you know? Um, but, uh, I don't know. We were, we were very, we were always very ambitious. Not like we wanted to spend more money on things, but you're trying to accomplish a really specific sound. It, it's not like we go into this like willy nilly, like, Oh, I wonder what this is going to sound like. It's like, it's, it's always, there's a sonic place that we're trying to get to and you kind of keep going at it till you achieve. And sometimes it's stripped down. Sometimes it's full. Sometimes, you know, so I don't know. We're kind of like it's aspiring like, filmmakers that make records. So for us, hmm. having resources isn't the worst thing. Yeah, it's not about... It's not a problem. It's not right? about spending the allotted resource. You know, it's not about using all the resources available to us. It's just about pursuing the one thing sort of... With or without the resources that we, if have. anything, it's just trying to keep your weird, the weird world that we have. You know, just trying to realize what's precious about um, what we have. You know, not take it for granted. And how hard is it to to keep the weird world that you have intact with with well, all of the attention that you get? I'm I'm proud that we've managed to do it so far. I mean, still, we didn't. We've never one time thought about what something was if something was going to play on the radio, like. Every single time we finish an album, we're like, "Oh right, what is there a single? What would the single be?" It's like we we've never really. No one ever has that conversation. Never, yeah. not before. We're no honestly, one said honestly, reflector is seven minutes long. Nobody said anything about that. Never, like no one's ever Amazing. said anything about that at any point. And well, we also have only surrounded ourselves with people who help us do what we right. what we want to do. Right. So it's and it's never that's never been. But on that point, I mean, in terms of the larger world, like Jeremy, as the band gets bigger. Uh, and you know, and and not, you're not just a band that's becoming world renowned in in a in a big big way. This is a big record, uh, but you also are a band that you know started at a in a very consciously grassroots way and has worked to sort of maintain. Um, I don't know how to put it. Other, you know, an organic, like keep it real sort of uh, mm. attitude. Um, you you almost receive more scrutiny because of that. People are are keeping an eye on you to see where you're going to slip up in, on that account. Do you feel that pressure? Do you guys talk about that? Not really, because we. I mean, we right now is is the the that exact moment where we're finished the record finally it's just been a couple weeks or whatever a month and we're starting to play shows we're starting to like get the word out and you know just changing gears a little bit and trying to spread the word about about the record we made and and uh starting to share it with people and for you know we're playing these small shows we played a bunch of shows in montreal the last month um and it's it's really not it's not for the purpose of somebody writing down, like writing about how cool the experience was to play in a show with a hundred people. Like for us, it's actually the core of our, like when said, like we've always been doing things the same way. And for us, this it's the same in playing live where it begins with us playing in a room together. And then as we start to share it, it's exciting to share it with a few people and create these, these moments, these small shows or whatever. Um, without thinking about the bigger picture of things like we still don't even know what our 
tour is like but you have year, to like, think about it right like how you you know you're going to tour we? the world and you're going to have to play you know and you're going to only do one gig in in you know london and london all kinds of people are going to want to see in london so you got to play a stadium yeah, or I mean, an arena not... and then all of a sudden you have to pay the cost of the arena and the tickets get char- charged and all of a sudden arcade fire is charging 50 dollars for a ticket and somebody's getting upset about that right yeah I mean, you, but I mean, yeah, we're not but... ignorant to that stuff certainly like and we we do get our nose in every single little decision but i mean if you go back and read articles in the enemy about the clash when they were putting out albums I mean, it, it's the same for everyone. Read, I mean, read the reviews of Low when Bowie came out. Read the reviews of Kid A. You know, it's like, I, I, I'm excited to get shitty reviews on this album. I can't wait, like, <laughs> because I feel like we've been doing something wrong if we're not. Every band I've ever liked, they put out an album, and, and Somebody didn't I read like the it, review yeah. in Q of Kid A, and it's like, this is garbage. And then, like, three years later, it's like, best album of the, of the decade, <laughs> yeah. best album of all time, you know? I, I'm not really interested in the immediate noise around stuff. Mm. We're never going to try and rip people off. Like, if we find out about something that we think is really not right, then we'll fix it. Like, we're not, you know, if we were phoning it in, we would just quit, to be honest. Like, we've, we're, uh, you know. Well, we scrutinize every decision until we're at peace with them. You and but couldn't once be any more th- scrutiny than what we put on ourselves. Yeah. There's not, it's not, but you're also very exist. careful about uh, and thoughtful about how you put yourselves out there. I mean, the, the, even the way Reflector rolled out, the, well, the, I mean, the video and the song. Well, we care all. about it because we want, we want people to hear the music and we want to create an atmosphere where people can actually connect to music because it's important. And it's, you know, when I was a kid and MTV was more of a thing, you could kind of get lost in the world of a video you know, if you were, it was possible to have these kind of artistic experiences through more traditional media. And now that isn't really the case. You're competing against, against the Kardashians or you're competing against stuff that's actually trying to suck that feeling out of the world. And so it's like, okay, how do you try and do something meaningful in that context? And, uh, well, and there's also so little, there's, we, we actually produce so little output. Like what we have is an 80 minute record, and I've never actually seen show. the Kardashians. That wasn't a dig of the Kardashians, yeah. by the way. I was just that's just but a word like, that sounds like a thing. It's it worth putting tons of effort into those into all the things that we do, whether it be like deciding like instead of putting a poster up, let's let's have someone do a chalk drawing on the ground, which right. seems like some giant marketing idea, but it's literally just like we have a record, we have a live show, and then we have like putting the word out about both those things. That's all we have to give. Or to share with people, you know, roughly, and how can we make those interesting? Um, yeah, and so part of that is like, well, we should, we should. I don't know. It's, 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 it's very, so it's very liberating, and it's yeah. very, it's it really is liberating and inspiring. I, I sound like a, uh, I'm, you know, I, I'm aware of how gushy it sounds for me to say that, but it really is to for a band at your level now to be continuing to clearly, as an artistic collective call all the shots when we're you know we're still told that you need a machine behind you to to carry things to where you've carried things it's really inspirational our kind of rule of thumb is to work 10 times harder for uh five percent of the result (laughs) (laughs) yeah how many emails about the chalk drawings (laughs) Well, uh, uh, before I let you go, I, let me uh, completely fanboy out and ask about the Bowie thing because no one seems to be able to get Bowie on their record. We were so naive. We th- we we genuinely thought it was going to be just like because I mean he sings sings on a lot of records. Uh, um, I mean credited almost. I mean yeah, like all the Lou Reed stuff and all the Iggy Pop back in the day backing vocals back in the day. And yeah, so not we now. actually in the he's not actually credited in the in the liner notes or anything like that. We were we were actually gonna. Because it's it's not immediately obvious if someone didn't tell you if you heard it. It was more there was there was just a line in the song that the lines that he sings in the song um, are supposed to be kind of a narrator, like a third person, and it never felt right me singing them. And so I kind of pitched him on the idea of singing it. It wasn't like he just randomly swung by the studio. Oh, okay, like, all, right, all right. So you did so because you know the story out there is no, that but he just it, dropped by. And that's then... just an enemy misquote kind of <laughs> sort of deal. I okay. mean, that's like kind of classic. Like, <laughs> so you you emailed him or something, or you called him and said, "Yeah, uh, I invited him down to hear the song. I sent it to him, and he really liked it, and was like, yeah, I'll sing on it.' And we he came down and 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 did it. Um, but yeah, I mean, our it was really just to have that slightly different voice. And then there's this, there's a kind of part in the song that's, um, 
it's like down, 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 which is yeah. which is a total total fame. Bowie. It's yeah, a fame. Yeah, 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 it's, yeah, I mean, totally. it's, it's it's actually kind of a fame quote. Yeah, but it was there was also this conceptual piece to it where because he did he did fame at the same studio we were mixing with John Lennon, and John Lennon actually helped write that song. I mean, he was in the studio, and and that was like he John Lennon sings all the backing vocals on that song. On fame on fame, yeah. and there was this really kind of cool thing where he was singing. A version on reflector he's singing a version of the fame harmonies in the same studio and when he walked in he was like oh the last time i was here is when i was doing fame with john lennon in the basement you know wow. so there was actually this kind of conceptual piece to it that that i think we were both kind of excited about too i mean from his perspective too it wasn't just like hey i should featuring yeah, yeah, yeah. featuring bowie song you know by the way, one thing you're wrong about, uh, uh, not to sound ridiculous about it, but it's its very clear it's Bowie as soon as you hear uh, that, that. To his, be honest, those, and those if two you didn't lines. know, for me it, it was. To be, if you didn't know, it wouldn't be, you would, you might you might be like, oh, is that a different person? I guarantee you, you wouldn't 100% say, stop the phone, that's Bowie. Like you wouldn't. <laughs> I did. I And I think a lot, bunch of people did. But you, you know. No, you know. I know Bowie. Are you kidding me? You know I Bowie sleep music. with Bowie in my ears. Exactly. I, I can't. I, I know his voice so intricately. He's got this very, very idiosyncratic style. So how would it make you feel if I told you that isn't Bowie? <laughs> <laughs> Would it change everything you know about That's the actually universe? My it would first actually. Vocal. It would actually make me really, really sad <laughs> because it would tell me that somebody knows. It's how the to guy do it. from uh, Jeremy. Yeah, we licensed his name for for <laughs> it's really, fifty thousand dollars. That guy from Police Universal Academy. Music Canada. People. You're hurting me. You're the hurting Police my Academy heart. Police Academy guy is really good at uh, impressions. Yeah, have you ever seen Police Academy? <laughs> the guy who does the uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's the yeah. guy who does. He yeah, also yeah. did all the drums on our album <laughs> and all of Regine's singing parts. He speaks French fluent. That's not me. Heretical. Uh, before I let you go, I mean, you've had this incredible rise in the ten plus years that you've been a band together. How do you, how do you measure success these days, you guys? What's what 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 does success mean to you now as Arcade Fire? Jeremy, you first, and then when? Happily married. Honestly, <laughs> like, feel good at home. Are and, you happily married, or yeah, you, that's happily, what you're going to measure no, no, success happily, as? No, okay. for me, like, um. Able, you know, we, like when was saying, we just, we work on the music and we treat it with respect and we work really hard on it. And at the end, you know, we don't, we don't finish things until we're proud of them. And then, but equally as important, like we're all healthy and mostly generally happy. And, you know, the, the, the balance of things is what's most important. It's not just the one thing mm. I, I think. Beautifully said. When? Um, Money. <laughs> Answer this one seriously. <laughs> Give me one. <laughs> Wynn was so good. At, I was just no, he was good. thinking he was, about yeah. like, oh, Wynn really got in. Yeah, he was good I was pretty one. good about all the non-acting really questions this whole interview. <laughs> how, how, um, seriously, though. No, for me, it's... For me, it's hard to not look at it. each little thing as its own little project. And... and um, you know, like when we did this TV special, it was an idea that I had a, a while ago and seemed like a really foolish idea. And then w when we did it, um, just being at SNL with Lauren and Lauren was like, when he watched it, he was like, this reminds me of exactly what I've been doing in 1972, like before mm -hmm. I started SNL. Um, you know, just like getting something like that on NBC, like just these little small victories, you know, like where you do a creative project, it kind of have something in your mind and then putting it in the world that kind of, you know, just when, when it all, all doesn't get lost in translation, uh, that feels like a success. You've made a brilliant, brilliant record. Thank you for this, you guys. Appreciate it today. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Thanks for your for time. Having us. Bring the band in the studio queue at some point. Okay. I don't think we can fit. <laughs> We're like a 12 piece now. We can, you can fit. Bring the Haitian drummers, even so. Okay. That, that's what I want. Thank you. Thanks, Wynn. Right. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks. Have a good one.